So, uh, all of you who uh, were at the conference on Saturday will be able to see the rest of the PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> we had it all figured out. We didn't have it. So. Yeah. <laughs> and the whole gun, what's going on here? Yeah, whole gun. <laughs> <laughs> you can say hi to everyone live right now. Okay. If they're watching me. People are watching me live. Huh? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Um, Well, that's good. So I got information. Information. So uh, uh, Simon and I went to Dublin on Sunday. We went there specifically uh, to go to a certain bookstore because <clears throat> bookstores are where you can find out the, the spiritual and social pulse of a nation or you know, a community. And of course, there was some tourist activity. We did kind of walk around, take in the sights, a few of them. But what we found in the bookstore was the most important. I think this used to be the Waterstone bookstore, and now it just had a initial, there are two initials, right? But it showed me that the religion of Ireland is. Uh, what Paul called the mystery of iniquity, you now occultism. There were 33 shelves devoted basically or strictly to a, you know, occultism as a subject. First title said occult, you know, and there were a number of shelves. And the second one said astrology, and there were a number of shelves. And three other titles said body, mind, spirit, and there were, you know, other shelves under that. Altogether, 33 shelves. Devoted to you know what's called New Age spirituality. Then in the self-help section, or what they call uh, popular psychology, or another 40 or so shelves, and that was predominantly you know 80 percent New Age books. And then there was something called alternative health, and that was predominantly New Age books. And then they had um, a section on Hindu and Buddhist religion, you know, Eastern religions. 
So all together, put it all together, there were 83 shelves devoted to New Age spirituality in the largest bookstore in Dublin, Ireland. Now I went and checked out the, or we went and checked out the religion section. That was a mere 26 shelves. And a lot of the books there, I mean, uh, by Rob Bell, Thomas Burton, you know, people like that. So the so-called Christian section uh, did not really reflect evangelical Christianity. It reflected more of a spirituality that would be, you know, the emerging church, uh, Catholic mysticism, you know, would be more in line with the, with the other section, you know, the, with the body, mind, spirit. So I believe this is the case throughout the entire European Union. If you were to go to Spain or Italy or Holland or Germany or France or Poland or Ukraine or you know, Greece or whatever, that's what you would find. The books that uh, people were drawing on for uh, you know, their spiritual nourishment would be along these lines. So this evening we're going to look at the rest of the uh, the, sl the slides that uh, I omitted on Saturday, I had to, since I only had two talks, I had to combine two. So we're going to look at the other half of these slides. And I think you'll find some of them quite interesting. Maybe all of them. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to do a, just a brief uh, for people that may be listening live, or for the people that uh, were not at the conference that are here now. We're just going to do a quick rundown of uh, the slides that were used in the conference. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just um, um, uh, go through uh, I'm go up, you know, just two seconds. This, okay, the, this is the new age didn't crest in popularity. So yeah. right. this is evidence. This is, these are books that I'm about to show are books that indicate that it uh, it has soaked in the next. Is, okay, I'll just say the name of the books, and then you can go. Yeah, this is The Making of the New Spirituality by Professor James Herrick. Uh, Spiritual but Not Religious by uh, Robert C. Fuller. Okay. American Beta by uh, Philip Goldberg. Bad Religion uh, by, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that guy's last name. <laughs> Looks like it might be French, so. And uh, then we have a. Uh, a survey by Baylor University, and according to the survey, 26 million Americans view God as a cosmic force. Well, this is the traditional view of uh, Eastern religion and occultism. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll go back to it. Is it Galpin again? Yeah, it's all I have in control of. Okay. Yeah, we had uh, Galpin PowerPoints on Saturday. Okay, next. Now that would be, for those of you in the U.S. that are listening, that would be more... Oh, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm cursed here. <laughs> this would be more uh, people than Episcopalians, Lutherans, Presbyterians, United Methodists combined. And these are all traditional major denominations in the United States. Okay, next. We have, um, uh, talking about bookstores, uh, law of supply and demand. That that section and next the next section across the aisle there are the uh, metaphysical or new age sections in the uh, bookstore in my hometown. There, 65 shelves altogether. 65 shelves were devoted to uh, this subject. And as I was saying earlier, this is also what I'm seeing in Ireland, in Dublin. You know, this is a massive. Uh, amount of shells devoted to it. Next, and just one segment, one segment. The New Age is quite a large uh, panoply of uh, you might call denominations in different aspects. They all more or less believe and teach the same thing, but they have different uh, emphasis or different characteristics. This is Wicca's Gerald Gardner. He uh, invented modern Wicca. He came up with uh, the Elements that make up the modern day witchcraft. This is uh, back in the 1950s when he did this, and that was a book that he wrote called Witchcraft Today. Okay, next. Oh, that's something. This is, this is interesting. 
than it used to be on top. <laughs> this is weird. Yeah, that 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 you know what's on the bottom there that belongs on uh, above that. I don't know that. Well, anyhow, this is uh, this is spooky. <laughs> Um, this is a Wiccan website, and it came online. I got it funny, isn't it? <laughs> oh, poltergeist activity. This is a, uh, a Wiccan website that came online in 1997, and since then they've got 480 million hits, you know, half, nearly half a billion. So it shows that Wiccan went from practically nothing to extraordinarily popular just in a matter of you know, 50 years or so. 50, 60 years. And again, you know, books directed to the young girls. Next, Harry Potter. In the third book uh, by Harry Potter, it talks about the superconscious, which is actually a term for witchcraft. And Simon can verify that. And he, he checked it out last night and he looked it up just so he could see it for himself. Okay, next. The mysticism is uh, the direct knowledge of God or spiritual truth. Subjective experience, right? and this is done through. Can somebody get me some water, a glass of water, or something? For some reason, once you start talking on a continuous basis, you get to kind of dried out. I know you've all seen this, but this is uh, for their benefit. You know, those two gentlemen over there, and then also uh, the people that are watching. Thank you. For those of you who are watching on the internet, uh, be patient. Probably uh, many or most of you uh, uh, were watching the conference on Saturday and you've already seen this, but we're getting to uh, um, the parts and elements you haven't seen, so just be patient, please. Okay, next. So meditation is the essence of mysticism. Next, you, you know, uh, focusing on your breath, uh, reciting a mantra or a word or phrase used over and over again. Next, it's uh, door, we, the doorway between worlds, the pathway between dimensions. Next, you can just uh, go for a little bit there. Yeah, this uh, this is the part that uh, probably most of the people watching this know that meditation is somehow part and parcel of your spirituality. But the emphasis on this on these talks is that uh, this has become no longer just something you find in cults. There's a gentleman at the conference on Saturday who started talking about transcendental meditation. Well, uh, or TM as it's called. Well, TM has traditionally been seen as like like a cult, you know, like an organization that draws people to it. But what I'm seeing, and this kind of backs it up, is that meditation has become very popular within mainstream society. You know, people that uh, would never join a cult have started doing meditation. Okay, next. And one, uh, one element that is particularly popular at the current time is uh, something called mindfulness. Which is in essence then Buddhist meditation. That's when you focus on your breath and it's uh, impacting these uh, these fields that you see here, especially uh, the counseling field and the uh, business field. Okay, next. And it's starting to pop up in very unexpected places like uh, Costco food stores um, put out this magazine and in the um, the, the current one, July of 2014, there's an article on uh, meditation and that it uh, um, has been seen as strange and new agey before, but no more. By the way, uh, aren't the uh, letters supposed to be in yellow? Well, that's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. And, uh, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. They're not supposed to be, but the, we, the ones that are in, um, in the combined one, it's or yellow. Different slideshow. Yeah, different slideshow. So I got to keep that in mind. Maybe that's why I got turned around. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. The um, yeah, the Time Magazine, the Mindful Revolution. 
uh, there's a whole magazine devoted to mindfulness. It's, it doesn't mean the same thing that uh, um, you were told as a kid, now be mindful and not to burp in front of others or something like that. Uh, it's basically, uh, focus on your breath and keep it focused. Okay, next. Here we have um, corporate mindfulness training. These are people that are, uh, we're going to have to go through this one to kind of uh, you know, fine tune it. But these are people at a General Foods Corp, the General Foods Corporation in the U.S. that are being taught mindfulness meditation. Now, I know you've seen all this before. Just bear with me here. Okay, next. Magazine, or I'm sorry, a book on uh, mindfulness. Next. Another book uh, by a uh, news anchor. Next. The Chia Seeds has a chapter, a book on Chia Seeds has a chapter. Mindfulness Solution on uh, Solving Your Problems. And here's the part that I want to emphasize, that uh, when you do this type of meditation, emptying the mind through, uh, through repetition, you become attuned to spirit. Okay, next. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, since this is Buddhist meditation, mindfulness, you get, uh, this is the result of attuning to spirit. That's right, you guys, since I combined, you guys didn't see that. I don't know who this was in here, was it? No, I don't think so. You know, get to see a new slide here. <laughs> okay, Buddhism denies the ultimate existence of any god or deity. Yeah, Buddhism does not believe in, in gods. They, what they believe in is called ultimate reality. You know, there is something that is like a, like a cosmic force, but it's not seen as God. It's just seen as ultimate reality. And, go ahead. The, Buddha, the Buddhist... Oh, go back. The Buddhist approach states that what is ultimately required for human fulfillment is a perfection of being that is found in who we already are. That sounds exactly like what we saw with Hinduism right? uh, in yoga. Okay, uh, uh, perfection of being in who we already are. Next, Buddha's advice is seek refuge in themselves and to seek no other refuge. We rely only on ourselves using various methods to explore our own human nature as it exists. That is actually from a Buddhist uh, publication. That wasn't a Christian, that was a Buddhist uh, um, philosopher, writer saying that. So you can see how mindfulness would absolutely run up against the uh, gospel, against uh, the teachings of Christianity. Because in Christianity, everything is focused on Jesus. You know, Jesus is. Uh, Everything that uh, brings forth salvation, goodness, not your own self. Okay, next. And again, you know, uh, the guide to mediumship. You can kind of see here that uh, if you're doing this kind of meditation, you're, you're actually involved with yourself in the cult practices. Okay, next one. And this one kind of sums it up. This is uh, Ken Wilburn's major intellectual in New England Circle. He said, if you're doing meditation correctly, you're in for some very rough and frightening times. Meditation has a relaxation response as a joke. Okay, next. Same thing. Yeah. Um, when a meditator is led to expect stress reduction, instead comes face to face with his true self, the result can be anything but relaxing. Okay, next. Okay, uh, more or less um, same thing as Marty Kaplan was... Um, uh, told by his doctor to meditate because he was chewing on his fingernails. Well, he stopped chewing on his fingernails, but he fell under the power of familiar spirits. He said, I got more than I bargained for. I got religion. Next one. He said, it ambushed me unwittingly. I was engaging in a practice that had been at the heart of religious mysticism for millenniums. So it ambushed me, and that's one thing I want to get across to those listening on the internet. But all these millions of people that are doing mindfulness meditation you now, where it's very possible, perhaps probable, they will be ambushed. Remember what uh, Paul said? In the last days, perilous times would come. Now, 
if he's talking about just physically, there's been numerous perilous times throughout history. There's been the bombing plague, the Black Death, there's been wars, there's been you know, all sorts of things that ended your physical life, but I believe he's talking about spiritually perilous times. Okay, next. Okay, yoga, then uh, we'll kind of rush through this real quick. 250 million people practice yoga worldwide. Okay, next. This uh, one organization, uh, Yoga Fit, trained 200,000 instructors worldwide. That's trained instructors, not people to do yoga, but people to teach yoga. 200,000, that's like an army. You know, each one teaches 100 people to do yoga. That's 20 million people. This is one organization. And this is her uh, book, Yoga Fit. And she talks about tuning into a frequency. It's not just about fitness and exercise. It's about tuning into a frequency. Okay, next. And this frequency tells her that we are all born divine. Okay, go back. I didn't get a chance to. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. We are all born divine. This is the classic statement of the perennial philosophy of yoga. What we are seeking is already at the core of our nature. We are already inherently perfect. We are all inherently perfect. Now, if you know one thing about the Bible, what the Bible teaches is the exact opposite of that. The humanity is not inherently perfect. Uh, the powers that be here. They're uh, working on the table. Can you go back? Uh, back. There we go. So they say that we're inherently perfect. It means that God is available fully in each moment simply because God is our true nature. And that is the gospel of yoga. God is our true nature. Well, in essence, you know, if God is our true nature, then we don't need to be saved. You know, salvation is just recognizing that you are God. And all the talk in the, in the Bible about, you know, believing on Jesus as your Savior and that he died for our sins goes out the window, right? It's as simple as that. And that's really the essence of the controversy here. But uh, uh, as I said on Saturday, I got to it mainly at the end of the talk. So I'm trying to document that if indeed 250 million people do yoga, and there's organizations that have trained 200,000 teachers, and that this is not a fad, this is going to keep growing and growing and advancing and advancing, that the world is going to be increasingly turning to this. And in essence, what I'm trying to reach people uh, for, what I'm trying to get across, is that society, all these societies, you know, Ireland included, are like turning into one giant cult. Society becomes one enormous cult. And that's what we saw there in Dublin. That when people want to be spiritual, they turn to things like this, yoga, mindfulness. Uh, there were whole tables devoted to mindfulness. We uh, assignments of many, many pictures. So it's more than just there's this aberrant spirituality. There's really far-reaching ramifications in this. In this. And again, there in yoga, the uh, classic uh, uh, greeting and parting is Namaste, the God in me bows down to the God in you. Alice Bailey, famous occultist, uh, advocated yoga. Next. Alistair Crowley, again, famous occultist, uh, advocated yoga. By the way, this is kind of off the subject a little bit, but doesn't he kind of look like Hitler there? Doesn't he? You think he does? Yeah, kind of resembles. He looks like Hitler there. <laughs> kind of strange. Okay, next. 
Um, this is what you didn't see. We're, we're now at the part that I cut off. And now you're going to get the full uh, the full uh, show here. Hey, you're familiar with borders, right? The borders was the actually Amazon drove them out of business, but up until a couple of years ago, borders was the equivalent of uh, Waterstone in the U.S. You know, they were like I think in Portland there were like four of them, three or four of them. You know, every Town of any size had one, and we were, it was a big town. They'd have a number of them, and they were huge. And they uh, see where it says music. They didn't just have books. They had uh, CDs, and they had movies, and they had a cafe. You know, they were huge. You know, and um, I used to go there and research all the time. Well, anyhow, I would go to the um, to check out the books on yoga, I would not go to the religion section. I would not go to the Hindu section. I would go to the fitness section. You know, fitness, you know, or running and soccer and sports and all that fitness. And in the yoga section, in the fitness section, every book practically, 95% of all the books would have a next would have spiritual uh, terms, spiritual uh, connotations. You would find words like samadhi. This would be in many, many books in the fitness section. And that is the eighth limb of yoga. Yoga has eight limbs or eight uh, stages. And the ninth one, or I mean the seventh, I'm sorry, the seventh one would be uh, um, meditation. That you see here, you know, using a mantra. But the eighth one was called samadhi. That is when you're absorbed into this cosmic force that they believe is God. That's when you achieve enlightenment. That's when these uh, energy centers we're about to see open. And I could see, I could see that even though it was being marketed as fitness, it was fundamentally spiritual. You know, what kind of spirituality, you know, is truly amazing once uh, you realize what we're dealing with. Okay, next. Also in these books on fitness, you know, yoga, there would be uh, references, to, references to the chakras. And in most cases, you would find a whole page with a picture of someone meditating like that. And you would see these chakras, and there would be on the other page would be a detailed description of what they're all about. And anybody who doubts this, all they have to do is just go on the internet and check out yoga and chakras. And the chakras are the very essence of yoga, the very essence. And what they what they are, they are not physical. You can't cut somebody open and see their chakras, but they're supposedly felt by people who do this. So in yoga, yoga means union. When you're doing this type of meditation, and we we turn back. When you're doing this type of meditation, and you, you've probably seen this in countless uh, magazines and newspapers and you know things like that. Countless. Okay, what they're doing there is opening the chakras next. So you're you're doing this meditation, and what's supposed to happen is these chakras start to open and this energy called the kundalini or serpent energy goes surging up the spine and as it goes surging up it activates these chakras it's called kundalini which means serpent power serpent power you know like a snake and as these chakras are energized then there's certain levels of awareness that are uh, connected to it and the top two um, deal with uh, occultic themes like the sixth chakra, third eye chakra, when that one opens you have psychic powers. And when the seventh one opens, you know that you're God, that you're divine. That's what we saw earlier. That everyone uh, is divine, but they don't realize it until they've done this, until they've activated the chakras. Okay, next. See, the chakras is the key to why we oppose yoga. This is a book called The Pocket Guide to Chakras, and it says the seven functions like a battery charger, renewing our connection with spirit. Again, that would be like spirit guides. Beings on other planes, so you didn't see this on Saturday. 
beings on other planes are eager to communicate with you if you are willing to be receptive to them. If you are willing to be receptive to them. Beings on other planes. Okay, next. This is, uh, this is taken directly from a particular book. Simon saw this book last night. And uh, he verified this. This is where it gets, this is where people would really think that, uh, you know, how could this be? This is impossible. This is where people would really get skeptical. I'm going um, to read this here. This, this is extremely important. Since I have seen, since I have seen uh, posters and flyers for yoga in virtually every little village here in Ireland, I mean, every little village, this is extremely important, and I want to emphasize this to the maximum. In meditation, the mysterious psychic energy can be sent up through these centers. This potent force is called this kundalini or serpent power. As, as the mighty force begins to flow within you, these vital psychic centers, the chakras, Begin to open in successive order. <laughs> uh, the sun's kind of blocking out the words there. So you would find this, the thing is, you would find this in any book on yoga, in any book. You would find this exact same thing. Okay, I'm going to show you where this, where this quote is from, the book this quote is from. You know. Anyone who is skeptical can check this out on the internet. Simon and I did last night. We found it but without very much trouble. This is, for those of you who can't see it, this is Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft. This mighty force begins to flow. Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft. And now you see why this issue is so important. Most people, when they think of witches, they think of Anton LaVey, they think of people in black robes, upside down crosses, and going, hey, little Satan, you know, things like that. Well, that's not, that's Satanism, that's more of a, uh, what would you call it, a theatrical type of thing. But real witchcraft, the kind the Bible talks about, is this. When you're actually possessed by a mighty force that makes you believe you're God. As we saw Saturday, you know, I shall be like the Most High. That is the essence of real Satanism. I shall be like the Most High. You know, that you were God, you were born divine. Okay, next. Um, this is a, the U.S. figures again. For those of you listening in the U.S., um, 20 million Americans practice yet. 20 million. To put that in perspective, the population of Ireland is three and a half now. And here's where it really gets scary. The Yoga Journal said that the 2012 study indicates that 8.7% of U.S. adults, or 20 million people, practice yoga. Of current non-practitioners, that's everybody else, 44% of Americans call themselves aspirational yogis, people who are interested in trying yoga. 44%. So that means that half of all American adults are open to trying yoga. And I would say the same thing would be true in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, England, Scotland, Ireland, Germany, I mean, the Western world. Huge numbers of people in the Western world are open to trying yoga. They see it as nothing more than a, a benign exercise. But in essence, the chakras are very much centrally linked to a supernatural um, transformational experience. Now, um, I'm going to ask Simon to help me construct this uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the Jack Hanfield, the guy who uh, put together the chicken soup for the soul books, this is where I'm going to put it. He was uh, raised Catholic. And then once he got older, he became like an agnostic. And he um, and wasn't sure whether there was a God. But he decided to take a yoga class as an elective in college. This was college now. This wasn't some Hindu guru. And he took the, the class and 
experience God flowing through all things. But this is not Yahweh. This is not the God of the Bible. He experienced a supernatural force he thought was God flowing through all things. And in essence, that's, that's, in essence, that's what Wicca is. Gerald Gardner, the guy you saw earlier, that is what Wicca is about. It's God flows through all things, and you can connect with this cosmic force, and you can manipulate it. You can kind of have it do what you want if you know the right methods. And that Wicca means to bend your shape. That's akin to where we get the word wicker basket from. You, know, you bend and shape things to your... Uh, your desire. Okay, next, U.S. Catholic. This is the uh, this is the official mainstream magazine for U.S. Catholicism. Okay, and we see here. Um, I can't, it's kind of hard for me to see. Uh, can you read the, the bottom there the, where the magazine is? It says. It says uh, and other religious practices strengthen your Catholic core. Yeah, yeah. Can other religious practices strengthen your Catholic core? And in in the um, in the article it says you can. It says it's not that we're bringing a Hindu practice into the church. It's a spiritual practice that happened to be used by Hindus, but could easily be used by anyone, including Christians. So in other words, yoga just happens to be used by Hindus, but anybody can use it. You know, you, you can, it'll make you a better Catholic. It'll deepen your your uh, religious uh, experiences. But the thing is, it's the same yoga as the Hindus do. That's kind of like, remember uh, Schuller? You know, the new, you know, we shouldn't forsake meditation just because the New Agers have it. We should take it back from them. <laughs> well, that's what makes them New Agers, <laughs> is meditation. And I got this article at a, one of the major Catholic universities in the U.S. Okay, next. Uh, okay, you're going to find this, uh, well, a lot of you are pretty young. Yeah, a lot of you are, this is more for your parents. Uh, this, we're going to go back to the 1960s here. <laughs> you may have uh, heard some of this, but this is how all this got started. It is much better. Okay, next. Uh, David Spangler was one of, again, he's like Ken Wilber, one of the major intellectuals. This movement, he said, in the mid 60s, there weren't many places where such a vision was taken seriously or even considered. And that was true, you know, New Age spirituality was hardly, excuse me, <laughs> never talk after you've eaten, <laughs> especially spaghetti. <laughs> um, it was very, very um, small, basically small. It was not something people knew or something that was around the next that started to change. That started to change around the late 60s. This, uh, this is an album by the group, you know, the Beatles. This is considered one of their more um, sophisticated albums. Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. And George Harrison had gotten into Hindu spirituality through uh, learning how to play uh, an instrument called the sitar. And he uh, started to explore Indian spirituality. And he wrote a song called Within You, Without You. And this was basically Hindu uh, spirituality. And there's a um, line that says, try to realize it's all within yourself. Now, remember what we saw about yoga? Remember what we saw about Buddhism? You know, it's all within yourself. That's basically all you need is within yourself. And he, um, he uh, uh, how many of you ever heard that album? Remember, there's a song that has a sitar, you know, and that's it. That's it. Uh, within you, without you, it has the, uh, the Hindu uh, drums, you know. It's totally unrock. It's totally non-rock and roll. But all these millions of Beatles fans uh, were being subjected to the view that 
It's all within yourself. Okay, next. So the Beatles became um, followers of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who um, was a practitioner and promoter of Hindu meditation as you know a a mass follower. He had he had uh, most Christian books on cults will have a section on transcendental meditation. Okay, next. Well, um, how many have heard of the Woodstock Music Festival? Okay. 1969, I think it was August of 69. We can't really see it here, but maybe you can. You see where the dove is, or the bird is? Just to the right, you see what it says? An Aquarian Exposition. Now why would a music festival be called an Aquarian Exposition? That's what the term New Age means, the age of Aquarius. You know, remember if you heard that song, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's the Aquarian age then. So what does the new rock and roll, what does music have to do with astrology? Well, I'll show you. Okay, next. This is the uh, beginning of the Woodstock Music Festival. Half a million people in the crowd, most of them between the ages of 18 and 30. You see the guy in the bottom there sitting on the, well, whatever you call that. That is Swami Satyadananda. He gave the benediction at the Woodstock Music Festival. And those are his followers sitting on the stage next to him. And he lectured these half a million young people on the need to meditate, that they need to give up drugs, they need to give up uh, drugs and alcohol and cigarettes. And they needed to meditate. They needed to involve themselves in mysticism. And that, friends, is why it was called an Aquarian exposition. Because it was the main thing was New Age spirituality. And that's when things really started to kick off. Okay, next. And then, of course, the Maharishi was on one of the major American uh, uh, talk shows. A uh, man named Merv Griffin. You ever heard of Merv Griffin? Uh, yeah. Griffin, that's an Irish name, isn't it? More or less. Yeah, he always looked like an Irishman. He kind of had that Irish look about him. And that's either here or there. But uh, yeah, Merv Griffin had him on. And after that, meditation just took off in the U.S. It just became more and more popular. And then it burgeoned as we saw on Saturday. Okay, uh, now let's shift to the breaky one, please. Oh, uh, that, no, the, the energy healing, I'm sorry, energy healing. There we go. Hey, uh, start going forward. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, a lot of this wasn't shown on Saturday. This is um, actually an encyclopedia of energy medicine. And according to this encyclopedia, there's 65 different healing modalities out there that are based on the chakras. 65. Reiki is, is just one of them. Numerous ones that uh, there's a number that are up there with Reiki, you know, pretty popular, but. Um, this shows that this is, you know, it's like multifaceted. Okay, next. There's the chakras again. These are all, these 65 methods are all based on the chakras. Okay, next. There we have a picture of them. Next. I wish I would have had that one in Saturday because that shows somebody doing Reiki on something. Um, they place their hands on it. Reiki is not massage. What they do is you lay on a table and they place their hands on various parts of your body. 
and they channel this cosmic force into you, they channel this energy into you. And one thing I found out that uh, since coming to the Emerald Isle, that practically everyone here in Ireland knows someone who does read you. It is extremely popular. Everyone knows someone that does it or has some kind of has been exposed to it. It is pervasive in the British Isles. And uh, I thought it was bad in the US, but it's really, really uh, strong here. Okay, next. It was, um, I don't know what it was invented, but it was rediscovered by this uh, person here, uh, Dr. Usui. He uh, was meditating on a mountain in Japan. And he uh, received a, you know, a, a mystical experience on that mountain. And when he came down, he was able to, uh, to heal, supposedly. Okay, next. Okay, next. And next. Okay, this is what we saw on Saturday. For those of you listening on the internet, we didn't hear uh, on Saturday. Uh, okay, next. The Reiki guides are a group of discarnate, non-visible healers that take part in every Reiki healing. The Reiki practitioner, or the Reiki one practitioner is probably not aware of them, but with Reiki two, they make themselves known. In Reiki three, they're running the whole show. Okay, next. During every attunement ceremony, I'm always aware of the presence of my Reiki guides. Okay, next. And this woman up in my neck of the woods uh, had, had 20 spirit guides and a Reiki practitioner, and they were her spiritual family. Next. Okay, Reiki once belonged to everyone. The Reiki guides wanted to be so again. Okay, next. So that's, that's what we saw. Oh, this, this is uh, Google search for Reiki deals 58 million results. 58 million results. Yeah, it is big all over the world. Okay, next. Yeah, this is what you didn't see. Yeah, this is the part that I left out. Uh, this is a Reiki master, an American Reiki master, who moved to uh, uh, the Czech Republic back in the uh, 80s, I not early 90s, actually, the early 90s, because there was no Czech Republic before 1990. So she was there for 13 years. And she taught, it says worldwide, but she taught, of those 45,000, 43,000 were in Europe. So based in the Czech Republic, she initiated 43,000 people to do Reiki. Now, again, like um, earlier, you know, the company who taught uh, uh, teachers, this is, she didn't do it on 45,000 people. She initiated 45,000 people to be Reiki channelers themselves. Just that one woman, just this one Reiki master. Okay, next. Okay, uh, next. This is a book called Reiki, or the Triple Whammy Cure, Reiki for Health. A lot of doctors are into this. After a first session, my patients regularly say, I really felt energy shifting within me. All, and then, can you read that? I can't read that. Yeah, all of a sudden, I, I knew what I had to do with my life. You know? This is a doctor, uh, David Edelberg. Okay, next. Okay, 800 hospitals in the U.S. have a Reiki channel on staff. That's 15% of all hospitals. Okay, next. Uh, day spots. Uh, in a Google search five years ago, the words day spa and Reiki, there were 100, what was it? 130,000 results. Today, there are over 2 million. So that's where you would find it. It's going to a spa or a big spa, something like that. Next. These are some of the, yeah, this is what I left out. So a lot of interesting stuff I left out on Saturday. These are celebrity fans of Reiki. Nicole Kidman, Uma Thurman, Angelina Jolie, that's Brad Pitt's wife. Uh, Naomi Watts, Kate Bosworth, Holly Berry, Sandra Bullock, Goldie Hawn, Helen Hunt, and Sharon Stone. Okay, next. Actress Sandra Bullock, who's really popular right now, she's in the space movie. Can't remember the name, right? Gravity, but she's real popular now. Uh, wear a Reiki infused jewelry by Los Angeles designer Reiki master Catherine Michaels. 
She, so she actually wears jewelry that has been infused with Reiki energy, which they believe will influence people that she's around. In other words, she can come to a room or you know greet people that are going to actually have an influence on them. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, Michael Flatley, does he ring, his name ring a bell? Riverdance. Uh, he was the original star in Riverdance. Yeah, I can't, uh, I have a hard time reading that. Can you read that uh, sign? So I understand so Star Michael Flatley says the secret of success is Japanese meaning of the character writing. Practitioners transfer healing energy to the patient by laying their hands on the backs of the patient's body. Right, you can get me back on stage just hours after painful leg injury and says, It sounds crazy, but the evidence speaks for itself. I start to feel better as soon as the new touches my injury. Mm -hmm. okay, next. Uh, Israel. Many practitioners in Israel, including 100 teaching masters, which means now there could be 20, 25, 30,000 Ricky Chandlers in Israel. Which you know has uh, interesting connotations. Okay, next, Dr. Oz, uh, America's doctor, uh, on January 6, 2010. This is I know he's not shown in, in Ireland, is he? No, but he's I think he's shown in England. But he's uh, he's a surgeon, very popular, and he has a daily TV show in the U.S. And he's, you know how Rick Warren is known as America's pastor? Well, Dr. Oz is known as America's doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyhow, on January 6th, that's right. That's right. Yeah, Dr. Oz and Rick Warren did the Daniel plan together. They were connected. Yeah, originally, uh, Dr. Oz was the, uh, one of the three doctors that was involved in the Daniel plan. Anyhow, Dr. Yeah, it's getting worse, the, the player. But anyhow, on January 6, 2010, Dr. Ahmed Oz revealed his ultimate alternative medicine secrets in 2010 during his nationally broadcast afternoon talk show. He ranked Reiki number one. Dr. Oz said, Reiki is one of my favorite favorites. We've been doing it for years in the Oz family, and we swear by it. This is the guy who was the head of the Daniel by Rick Warren. <laughs> okay, look at where it got it. Next, this is what this is where Reiki led Dr. Oz. This is a book called The Instruction: Living the Life Your Soul Intended. Okay, this is the ultimate Scottish name, Ainsley McLeod. <laughs> Ainsley McLeod. Is that not Scottish? Without a doubt, this Ainsley McLeod. Well, uh, see at the bottom, Dr. Oz. I can write a rent. Oh, we will have it here pretty soon, but you can see the recommendation that will. The instruction is the following. Okay, next. First, I'll read the part that, uh, man, it's getting worse. Um, one time, I mean, I don't need sunshine. It's sunshine. <laughs> okay, I recommend this book to those who seek greater spiritual well being. You get that? Greater spiritual well being and a better understanding of their life's purpose. And that's what we saw on the. Uh, on the front cover there. Okay, maybe this will work. You know the old saying where there's a will, there's a way. Okay. Well, it's kind of hard to. This one, 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 one. Yeah, there we go. This may work. Yeah, I think that'll work. Have you ever said, this is what the book is about. This is what the book is about. It's okay. It's okay. I think I can do it. Okay. Have you ever sensed that your life has a deeper, more meaningful purpose, but don't know what it is? If so, you're not alone. To help you and millions like you, Psychic Ainsley McLeod Spirit Guides have given him a systematic approach to uncovering who you really are and the life your soul has planned for you. Who you really are is your God. So his spirit guide, this book, the instruction, is how you can um, realize that you're God based on his spirit guides. 
Well, Dr. Oz says, uh, I recommend this book to those who seek greater spiritual well-being. So you can see where Reiki led him, right? Okay, next. And this is his wife, Lisa Oz, and she is a certified Reiki master. It says so in this book. Um, uh, I should have the page, but you can find this book online and you can see. You know, she's a certified Reiki master. Okay, next. Um, you know, this Kyle. <laughs> This is the Bible Belt. This is the Bible Belt in the U.S. The doctor in Kentucky sent this to me. Okay, this is Reiki being sponsored by state and county government. This is in Kentucky. This is uh, Frankfort County Board of Education and uh, Kentucky Department of Education. State, official state organizations. And there you see where it says Reiki 1 and Reiki 2. Uh, at a local high school, they are sponsoring Reiki initiations. And you can see it. I mean, there's the proof. Franklin County um, uh, Community Education. This is not some cult or some wacky group. This is state and county government in a state of the Bible Belt offering uh, Reiki initiations. Next. In northern Canada, this is Peace River, Alberta, which is way, way, way north, you know, up in uh, the farthest regions of, um, you know, way north of Edmonton. So even up out there, you can find uh, Reiki groups. This is a, a Reiki center that uh, is offering initiations. I mean, this, this is so far north, you can actually see Santa's helpers taking cigarette breaks. You know? So, it doesn't matter where you go. You know, this isn't something you just find in, like, uh, real liberal uh, you know, hot spots. When I found out there was Reiki in Peace River, I mean, that was just out in the middle of nowhere. You know, why should there be Reiki there? I mean, who's interested in a place like that? And you can see, you know, I decided it was time for a change, so I made it. How about you? Well, the change you'd make would put you in the same category as Dr. Oz. Okay, next. There's other types of energy. You know, we didn't get into that on Saturday. Okay, next. There's uh, remember this book, Hands of Light. Like I said, there's 65 different groups, not uh, groups, 65 different modalities or types. And they're all based on the chakras, and the chakras are based on those beings on other planes that want to connect with you. If you are open to them. Well, in this book, by the way, this book has sold 1.2 million copies. This um, this woman has uh, it's called the Brennan the Brennan technique or something like that. She has a school in Florida, and she has one in Austria for training people in this. And we're gonna I think I used this Saturday. One picture is worth a thousand words. Remember, I use that. Okay, I'm gonna show show them the next picture, and you can see that there's somebody on the table, and there's uh, a woman doing it on the and you see those figures on the right and the left. Those are the guides. See, that's where the power is really coming from. That's where it's really coming from is the entities that are on both sides, and in it it says enlightenment is the goal, healing is a byproduct. So it's not it's not real healing. It's by light. You know that you're God. You know that you're divine. You need to look at that for a little bit. Okay, next. This is Therapeutic Touch, founded by a nurse, Dolores Krieger, 1972. And she admits that it has a high occult factor. This is used in many hospitals. Okay, next. Um, you can read that. 653,000 results for therapeutic touch. Next. Uh, quantum touch. That's another one. We can go through this real fast. Quantum touch is uh, quite popular. Next. Well, this guy, Richard Gordon. Uh, he's a doctor. He. Uh, uh, Starting this organization next. The, um, 
His book is The 17 Languages Next. There's his book there. And in this book, we find out that uh, Richard Gordon reveals in his book that he learned about the chakras from Lazarus. It's not Lazarus, it's Lazarus. Well, Lazarus is a spirit guide with whom people have blendings with. Blendings. So the, the, the origin of this is familiar spirit. Next. Okay, then again, this is uh, one picture is where the thousand words. That's kind of a dramatic picture, isn't it? Well, there's something out. There's most likely this in, in Ireland, probably in Cork. If you look, you could find it in Cork. It's called the oneness blessing. And it's like Reiki on steroids. And whereas Reiki may take an hour to do it on you, the oneness blessing only takes two minutes. So you see this picture here? This is what it's supposed to represent. See all those statues of Buddha? Okay, they were people. Originally, you had like a whole line of people there. And someone who's trained in the oneness blessing is going along and zapping them, and then they turn into a Buddha or a enlightened being. See, now she's going to turn into a Buddha, and then he's going to go on to, see the guy there, he's got this big grin, like, I'm next. You know, I'm next. And the oneness blessing is very much like Reiki. You have to go to India to this uh, place there, this ashram, and be trained in it. And it takes a long time to be trained in it. But again, you come back and you start doing it on people. And the thing with the oneness blessing, you can get a whole bunch of people together and do it on. You can get like 50 people together at one time and just do it, on, do it on two minutes and zap a whole bunch in one setting. That kind of, again, the view is, is that enough people to get in the oneness blessing, the whole world can be turned into Buddhists or enlightened beings. Okay, next. Millions of people have experienced it. Many thousands the world over are flocking to India to learn how to administer it. And celebrities, from movie actors to high-tech executives to self-help gurus such as Tony Robbins. How many of you here know who Tony Robbins is? Okay. Are swearing by it. It's called Diksha. That's, that's the Hindu term. And we believe its proponents, this new form of spiritual transformation is going to have quite an impact on spirituality in the new millennium. The next this is someone who uh, went to a Tony Robbins uh, seminar. Thank you so much for sharing this beautiful experience. I just returned from a Tony Robbins event where the oneness blessing was given twice during the week-long event. I know I want to see this spread across the whole planet for the healing I know we can all enjoy. So Tony Robbins is doing this on the hundreds of people that attend his events. He's doing it on everybody in a mass way. Okay, next. So this is where we started, you know, on Saturday about uh, the healing power of Reiki. And uh, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because <clears throat> um, I can't totally ignore it because there may be people. Um, certainly there's two here and then people on the internet who haven't seen it. This woman um, is a Reiki master next, New York, uh, the most popular Reiki master in New York City next. And she says, we all have a right to connect to our spirit guides. Every person interested in Reiki can make a personal connection with a guide. This is a spirit who is the overseer of your Reiki experiences as a delicate to those of us, valuable to those of us who practice Reiki. Your Reiki master and spirit is a powerful being on whom you can depend. And now that you've seen that, um, how popular Reiki is, you know, you can understand what that means. Okay, next. And this is this was one of the major um, um, keynotes I wanted to get across last Saturday that there was a woman in Portland, Oregon who went to a Reiki Chandler and next, next and uh, wound up with a spirit guide as a result, which she called her inner teacher. This inner teacher said, when the coming together time is here, you will all slip in the air without much resistance to each other. That induction will come as a snap when enough of you are united in spirit. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing the world being united in spirit. You know, namaste. The God in me bows down to the God in you, which would be these, these entities, these spirit guides. This is not the God of the Old and New Testament. This is not the God of the apostles. Okay, next. Okay, next. 
The master will die. Do not have concern. It's all happening. Make every value is commonplace. Get it out there for every man. I love you, Storma. Nothing is more important than to be a clear, resonating vessel to channel through the will of the universe. Trust in me, your Lord. So here we have a case where, like Dr. Oz, a woman went to a Reiki channel and now has a spirit guide, which now is her Lord. Okay, next. Uh, this, if you didn't see this, this is, uh, this is very important. This is that uh, that woman that had 20 spirit guides and they were her spiritual family. Well, this is her. This is in the uh, fall 2013 issue of Breaking News Magazine. And she, this, this would be very true of Iron Man. She uh, gives a uh, uh, rundown of the type of uh, persons that are coming to her to be initiated. Today, people of all religious and spiritual backgrounds practice Reiki. I've had Reiki students from a wide variety of religions. In one class, I had a Muslim, Hindu, Catholic, fundamentalist Christian, and agnostic. Fundamentalist Christian, okay, next. My students are teachers, psychologists, healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors, veterinarians, massage therapists, horse and dog trainers. Yoga teachers, engineers, biologists, firefighters, EMTs, soldiers, corporate executives, moms, dads, kids, you name it. What I have learned from my Reiki classes, clients, and readers is that we are the mainstream. We are the mainstream. So when you understand that what they're talking about, when we are the mainstream, are the likes of what you saw about the woman that uh, had the inner teacher. That is becoming mainstream. The okay, next. In 2011, Presence Magazine, the official magazine of Spiritual Practice International, SDI stated that there were now 2 million Reiki channelers in the United States. They went from 1 million in 2004 to 2 million in 2011. That means they're doubling every so many years. Two million. Okay, next. In the early to mid 1990s, Reiki was pretty much an unknown word in the UK. There were few there were few books on Reiki in the major stores, and it had yet to be discovered in a meaningful way. Next. From the year 2002. Why don't we uh, go back? I want you to see this. Okay, go back. In the early to mid 1990s, Reiki was pretty much an unknown word in the UK. There were a few books on Reiki in the major stores, and it had yet to be discovered in a meaningful way. Okay. From the year 2002, it would be difficult to find a village in the British Isles where there are not a number of Reiki practitioners. There's been an enormous proliferation and has been written about in all manner of publications, including the national press. So from, two, from 2002, it would be difficult to find a village in the British Isles where there are not a number of Reiki practitioners. Village, not town, but village. And that would be true of Ireland from what I'm getting, from what I'm hearing. So do you see the ramifications of this? This is not going to go away. This is not something that's a fad. Okay, next. Again, you know, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled, corrupted by them. I am the Lord your God. No, Reiki Chandlers are modern day wizards. And Thanks very much for that, Ray. And um, we're just going to close with uh, Ephesians chapter six. Just as I was as I was listening there to Ray, and um, this verse just came to my head. So it says in Ephesians chap chapter six and verse ten, it says, "Find me, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil." 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. It says, Stand there, for having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and it continues on there. But I encourage you to, to read chapter 6 of Ephesians um, in your spare time, and to really look at this, that, you know, we set aside time, we, we generally study the Bible on Tuesday evenings, and we set aside time to really look at these things, such as Reiki, yoga, and all these new age um, uh, new age practices that are, you know, they're all around us. As Ray said, he's going through little villages in Ireland and he can see all these things, you know, for Reiki, for yoga, for the whole lot. So it's really something that's infiltrated Ireland. I, I personally know many people who do Reiki in Ireland and yoga. Uh, and unfortunately, now it's something that has come into the church. Uh, people are changing the name, you know, the mantras to Jesus, and they think it's okay. But as we've seen from Ephesians chapter 6, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. This is against principality and powers, you know, and things of a spiritual meaning. And that's why we have to focus on God. We have to focus on His Word and the redemptive work of Christ. So thanks all for listening. God bless. I'll actually finish with prayer. Lord, we just thank you this evening, Lord, for what you, what you speak to us from your Word, Lord, and even sending Ray over here. And just to take time out of his schedule, Lord, to come be with us here in Ireland and just to bless us with the research that he's done. Uh, he's been researching this for a long time, Lord, and I pray that you continue to bless him, continue to get this message out there, Lord, and, and more importantly, continue to get people to um, to focus on you, Lord, to draw men to you, Lord, to study your word and, and ultimately to receive salvation from you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. We praise you that you who sent him for our sins to die on the cross, God, and that he was again proven he was God, Lord. Not a false God, but he was the God, Lord. And thank you for him. In his name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.